And uh, so I'm very attracted by any concept that, that really uh, gives to human beings the ability to be intellectually uh, or financially and spiritually free. Because um, anyone nowadays living in, in the West or anywhere in the world, if you're not tuned in to the frequency of freedom, uh, you're, you're, you're probably not understanding what's going on in the world or what's going on in your own backyard. From constitutional lawyer to epic podcast host, the journey of an entrepreneur uh, in the Alberta quadrant. We are joined to together today by uh, my friend and partner, Jason, of course, and Leighton Gray, who is uh, an incredible litigator, well-known in the Canadian uh, space. And he launched uh, in 2022, the Gray Matter podcast. Now, this is a, a very interesting and wonderful podcast with a curation of intelligent conversations thought-provoking leaders all over the world, tackling topics that are often taboo and outside of the box. Um, we're very excited to have you on the podcast today, Leighton. Um, we got connected, of course, uh, recently because I was invited to join you on your incredible show, which was a huge and tremendous honor for me to be a part of your program and uh, in res res uh, reciprocity, of course, and also just because you're an amazing guy to talk to with so many wonderful lessons to share with our listeners. We're excited to have you on our program today. Yes, it's my pleasure, guys. I'm really looking forward to the to the conversation. Let's begin with what inspired you to become an attorney. That's a that's a really great question. I've been asked a lot. Um, I'm going to answer it this way, and uh, I, I get asked that question in combination with this one. Um, you know, what does it take to be a lawyer? What kind of a person would want to be a lawyer? And I sort of answer those in the same way. And that is uh, my inspiration is that uh, as a young person, um, I wanted to do something that was gonna be different all the time because I'm very easily bored. I'm insatiably curious. And so you wanna, you have to be the sort of person who uh, doesn't like the mundane is trying to escape that. So you have to be curious, that's number one. Secondly, uh, you have to really like solving problems because that's really what you're doing. And, I, I'm sure it's no different for you guys in the work that you do. People come to you with problems. They they need your help and and you get joy out of helping them see them, uh, you know, achieve their dreams and, and get them over little hurdles or big hurdles. Uh, and that's a big part of lawyering as well. It's just you have to love to take up our problems and try and solve them. But the number one most important factor and the reason why I wanted to be a lawyer, and I think is the most important uh, ingredient ingredient, if you will, you have to really want to help people. Uh, if you really, if you don't want to help people, uh, you're not going to be any any earthly good in any sort of service providing role. And as a lawyer, you are a service provider. And uh, sadly, some lawyers in their profession don't see themselves in that way, which I think is the proper light. That's a true vocation for a lawyer: is someone who helps other people solve problems by applying a particular type of knowledge and acumen and skill. Um, and so those are the those are the main ingredients. The intangible that I think separates uh, people like me who are litigators from lawyers who are not is uh, you have to be highly competitive because yeah. unless you have a really strong competitive drive, unless you don't get excited about going up against other lawyers, uh, and if you don't have a strong drive to, to win and achieve results, then you really can't. Uh, you really can't survive in the game against the kind of people that populate uh, the courts. So those are the main things that I think got me into it. I've always been very competitive. Had a background in sports, but uh, mainly, you know, I just uh, I, I can't handle anything that's the same all the time. And I really enjoy solving problems, and I love helping people. So that's it in a nutshell. I would imagine uh, being a litigator and and with a specific forte in the constitutional zone of of law practice, you've gone up against some of uh, the Goliaths, you know, in a David Goliath type battle for for your clients. And I'm curious, you know, as you think about that competitive nature and 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 taking on large and big types of litigation cases of that nature, I would imagine it comes with a that challenge, but also there's mm -hmm. some stresses involved because. You know, you may not get compensated at your law firm, you know, depending on how that situation until like a case is won. And some of these things drag out for years and years and years, I would imagine. So, mm -hmm. you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, just thinking about some of the journey and, and the issues that other types of entrepreneurs also face, you know, how has that showed up in your life a little bit if you share with that? 
Well, I've always been, I started out uh, in government practice. I articled at the Federal Department of Justice. Articling is a sort of apprenticeship that lawyers go through, law students go through when they graduate to during the year when they write the bar exam. And I was at the Federal Department of Justice, which was great because um, it's, it's really the largest, at the time it was the largest law firm in the country, really great lawyers. I got to work on cases that were going up at the Supreme Court of Canada and really some really terrific lawyers and mentors there. And that was great. But I also learned within that year that I was not cut out for government life. Uh, I wanted to be, I always had a strong entrepreneurial streak. I wanted to be independent. Um, I've always been someone who is not terribly risk averse. In fact, uh, I'm sort of the guy who gets pulled back. Uh, I'm the one going over the cliff. A lot of times my partners will tell you, I wanna go over a cliff and I figure I can build a parachute or an airplane or something on the way down. And sometimes, you know, I land like Wale Coyote, but as you know, he never dies. He just keeps sending away for more stuff from Acme. Uh, and so, and so that, that's kind of my approach. And so I've taken that into, you know, into my approach to my practice. And so I got into uh, private practice now uh, about 28 years ago. And, and the practice grew from sort of a small smattering of uh, things like criminal law, family law, that type of thing into something much larger where I was involved, for example, in the, uh, in the National Indian Residential School class action. And I represented more than 300 claimants in that process. And uh, we've had, you know, large scale personal injury cases um, and I've done, you know, murder trials in front of juries. Uh, so I've been able to experience a lot of that. And, and through all of it, uh, I think, um, and this would probably resonate with many business people out there. I've been very, very fortunate to have uh, some great mentors in the practice of law, but also I've had really wonderful partners. Uh, and I found that um, I've been through a couple of business divorces that I got into initially. Uh, good people, but I just found out that we were not on the same page, entrepreneurially yeah. speaking. And, um, and so amicable, you know, parting, but the, the partners that I have right now, you know, I, I've discovered over time that the most important thing about being in business with someone else is uh, you have to sh have a shared set of values. You have to kind of want the same things. And, and also in our situation, we have four partners and we're all, we all have distinct personalities. We all bring different things to the table. And uh, some of us are more conservative or reactionary in our thinking. Some of us are more, let's go over the cliff, over the falls in a barrel. And, uh, you know, we have great conversations and we learn from each other. We support each other, whatever happens. And uh, I think those are the big keys that have made our business uh, successful, is being in business with the right people, great people, uh, with a shared set of, of values. Um, because... If you don't have that shared that that you know that sort sort of shared set of values, you really there's there's no future for the business, no future for any relationship, whether it's a friendship or a marriage or a business partnership, or a relationship with a bank. Uh, you know, unless you have a shared set of values, uh, you know, there's uh, you know you're going to hit a wall eventually. <laughs> Richard knows where I'm going with that one. And you know, <laughs> one of the things that um, I, I was really excited just to to address in conversation with you is that. When so in in our uh, business and our practice, when a, a client begins their journey and they they put a policy in place or or a system of policies in place, and we use language in our education and our uh, description of the attributes of of a policy, we refer to it for what it its correct characterization as a unilateral binding contract, and. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those words can be lost in, in, in terms of not really having a grasp on the significant advantage that that represents when, right. if, you th if you contrast that with a variety of other financial products and instruments that are available to, to the consumer, when you're dealing with a unilateral binding contract that has very specific contractual guarantees and elements that are all designed to protect the policy owner. Mm -hmm. That is significant. And I'd love to hear just uh, respecting your area of purview and, and what you do uh, in practice, but I'd mm -hmm. just love to hear what came up for you and your insight when, when you discovered that. 
Well, uh, what you mentioned there is really uh, one of the things that really intrigued me and attracted me to, to Mr. Nash's whole concept. Uh, becoming your own banker. And uh, one of the beautiful things that he does, and he gives, even though he's not a lawyer, I have to say he gives one of the best descriptions of the the essential power of a contract yep. uh, and the unique power that is uh, that says that, that can be unleashed in people's lives. You know, this concept of, an, of a contract is really quite unique to Western law. It grows out of the, uh, the common law tradition um, and really, it's 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 shaped so much of our Western culture and traditions and law and business. But I think one of the things that really attracted me to uh, and what I really appreciated about Mr. Nash's book is how he describes how this you can make the power of that contract work for you. That it's something very unique in our law and really not clearly understood. Most people uh, go around in their daily lives and they're oblivious to the fact. That at every moment of their lives, they are living or engaging in some type of contract. They carry around uh, these pocket computers and there's a contract with Bell or Talus or Rogers or whoever there. They go into a store and they buy a coffee at Starbucks or Tim Hortons. Well, there's a contract occurring there, you know, uh, even even in their daily lives with with your with your wife or your spouse. There's a form of contract there. Uh, you know, the lease on your, on your car, your insurance contracts for your house, everywhere you go, you are confronted by this law of contract. And you'd better understand it and get to appreciate what it's all about um, if you if you want to be able to take advantage of it. Because oftentimes, if you don't understand how those contractual concepts work, they can work against you. And right. uh, and so that's one of the great things about the book that I really enjoyed. And And actually, I mean, I have... I've used some of the language in in his book uh, to to explain, you know, contractual concepts to clients. I mean, there's an old adage that every that a good lawyer is a good thief, uh, in the sense that we steal the best ideas everywhere we go, right? And <laughs> definitely, uh, and definitely so, great invoicers. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Then another type of contract, right? The retainer. There you are, right? And uh, so it's very important that people understand. Because uh, within that that contract is great power, yeah. and potentially, potentially the type of financial freedom, the type of freedom that people are are looking for, uh, the ability to wow to be your own banker that's like a dream, and so yes, I was very attracted to that, and uh, the one thing that uh, also attracts me like a moth to a light bulb is whenever we get into conversation about freedom. Because I happen to think, uh, and this is getting into my own uh, faith life, I'm a Christian, and uh, I happen to believe that the natural state of human beings is to be free, and to the greatest extent that we pursue freedom, I mean, I, I mean true freedom, in terms of being able to live out our dreams and live lives that are meaningful, um, and, and free of, of, of pain and sin. That uh, to that extent, we are living out our best lives, the lives that we were meant to live, um, and, uh, and, and really the life that our Savior lived. And, mm -hmm. and the reason why we were redeemed uh, is to live that way. That's how we're supposed to live, is to be free. And uh, so I'm very attracted by any concept that, that really uh, gives to human beings the ability to be intellectually uh, or financially and spiritually free. Because um, anyone nowadays living in, in the West or anywhere in the world, if you're not tuned in to the frequency of freedom, uh, you're, you're, you're probably not understanding what's going on in the world or what's going on in your own back, back, uh, backyard. Amen to that. Uh, completely and wholeheartedly agree with you. And it, it brings us to and reminds us of when we're in conversation with others financial freedom, like we discussed prior to, to recording that, you know, it's, it's something to be created, not pursued in right. the sense that, you know, you've heard the expression, the pursuit of happiness or, well, right. that's, it's not a pursuit. It's something that is created. And so mm -hmm. when, when you're, when you're giving, uh, putting the best tool for the job in the hands of someone, 
And you're giving them a tool that empowers them to create financial freedom for themselves and their families and their uh, employees. If they're a business owner implementing the process, you're really, you're really doing a great service to others. Not to mention that as Nelson would have uh, shared, had he been with us today, God rest his soul. He would have shared that there's a death benefit thrown in for good measure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. How great is that? How great is that? So, you're bestowing, you're, bes you're bestowing some measure of happiness on the people who mean most to you. One yeah. of the books that I, that I was reminded of when I was learning about Mr. Nash and, and his financial philosophy is a book by Dennis Prager, who's written a number of wonderful books. If you're familiar with Prager U, but he wrote a book in the late nineties called happiness is a serious problem. And in that book, he, he really explains that most people's, our concept of happiness is really wrong headed. Most people think of happiness in terms of a destination or the avoidance of pleasure or the, or, or the, the avoidance of pain, the pursuit of pleasure. But actually uh, what Mr. Prager talks about is, and this taps into the sort of the Judeo-Christian uh, ethic, is that happiness is that wonderful fleeting feeling that you get when you are no, when you know that you are doing something good, right? right. It's right. sort of like the feeling that you would have, you know, you, you, you're helping an old lady cross the street. Yeah. Or maybe the feelings the Good Samaritan had, you know, in, in the New Testament, you know, that type of, but it's, it's not something you can hang your hat on and pin your, it's a journey, right? And, and the journey is not towards happiness, but it's towards some understanding of living a meaningful life. And I happen to think that's what Mr. Nash was really talking about. He was talking about uh, helping people become financially free or in control of their finances so that they could live more meaningful lives and have the money that they need to do the things that matter most to them and to live out their best selves in terms of their, you know, their work, their businesses, their families, their futures, and to create, wow, this beautiful, beautiful gift of generational wealth, generational wealth. That's, that's the one thing that I think, uh, uh, I mean, what, what is, what is a better gift that you could leave to your descendants beyond, you know, the memories that you shared with them? Yeah. which is part of the concept, but this generational wealth so that, you know, going forward, they'll, they'll, they'll never have to worry about, you know, paying back the bank and paying off them, the type of things that, that make it hard for so many people to just put their head on their pillow at night and go to sleep. You know, yeah. the types of things that give people ulcers and anxiety and heart attacks and strokes, you know, um, it's no wonder that he lived such a long, a long life. You know, he might not have lived as long as he as he had if he hadn't been working so hard to bring so much freedom and happiness to other people. And uh, I watched some of the videos of Mr. Nash, you know, when he was getting into his later years. And it was remarkable to see how uh, motivated, how inspired he was uh, to share these concepts and these ideas with people. Um, you know, that's that's a, I mean, when you look at that, that's a meaningful life, you know. And uh, and so I really found I find him. And his message and this concept of, you know, infinite banking uh, to be, to be uh, you know, in a true sense, inspirational. It's not just money. Uh, I think that's a mis If people read what Mr. Nash wrote or listen to him, I think, and they think that, then I think they're just getting a small piece, maybe one, one straw in the bundle of what he was trying to teach people. What a joy it was to know him and to just be blessed beyond measure to have been mentored by him for so many years. And uh, I think that you would have gotten along very well with him. And he was just such a, it was always great to, to be around him. Uh, he had just such a, a great way of being so generous with his wisdom and his insights and his knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he was brilliant absolutely brilliant at getting you to think about your thinking he would um he would occasionally send a book with a little handwritten note and it would read once you get through chapter three 
I want you to think about it and call me. <laughs> and so you, you had your marching orders and, uh, you know, you get through chapter three and you pick up the phone and you call him and he would share a conversation with you to draw out your thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he would, uh, he would always save his wisdom and insights until the very end of that process, because he really truly wanted to understand what you were thinking. And there was always, whenever he did that, there was always an embedded lesson. There was something that he mm -hmm. wanted you, he wanted you to arrive there on your own thinking path. He didn't want to just point it out to you. Right. He was just that's a definition so of, brilliant. that's a definition of mentorship, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Very and uh, Galileo said this, Galileo said something on the same lines. He said, you know, you could never really teach anyone anything, right? Right. All you can do is point them to the knowledge, right? That's, you know, and, and really they have to do the rest, but mentors have a gift for doing that. Are they, and he had, I, I believe he had an inspired gift for doing that because really uh, when you consider the concept as a whole, and I don't understand it as well as you guys do, um, but, but, uh, I do read a lot. And when I, what I see his book as is, is really an example of mentorship. I think that's what he meant it to be Yeah, it is an exercise in mentorship so yeah. that anyone can pick up the book and understand that this is something that was being taught to them for them and for their benefit, as opposed to, let's face it, a lot of the financial books out there are, are not that's not, that's not why they're written. Okay. They, I mean, they all, they all have something to offer, but I mean, you know, Mr. Nash's book is not a Robert Kiyosaki book. It's right. not a Ray, it's not a Ray Dalio book, right? Not to disparage those gentlemen, you know, they're all very, they're very successful, but, but I don't, I mean, those books are, are not anything like what Mr. Nash wrote and they're not purposed in the same way. Very, very true. Nelson said that it was about the message, not about the man. And he he was very adamant about that up until his very last day. And interesting, he shared with us um, in the last couple of years before he passed that the, the 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 last 20 years of his life had been the most amazing years of his life. And he was on fire. He was amped up. Other than, you know, ailments building up and and yeah. uh, uh, he, he ran into this thing called the movable object theory. Maybe Jason will share that story in a moment. But <laughs> Uh, he, you know, so he was just an absolutely hilarious guy and he was exceptionally well read. And so I think you and Nelson would have really become fast friends because you would have been sharing quotes from books and stuff back and forth. You would have really appreciated that. But one of the things that Nelson was really good at was talking about, um, you know, again, the the classification of things. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you and I, Leighton, we've shared a little bit about our overarching views on certain, uh, let's call it policies that come down from on high uh in our, in our in our current you know governing status but when it when it comes to uh misclassification nelson thought that life insurance whole life insurance specifically was grossly misclassified it should have been called a personal monetary system with a death benefit on the side for good measure of course we'd need to come up with some you know finicky acronym to explain that um but then additionally he talked a lot about secession peaceful mm -hmm. secession from a, a world or an environment or an idea, uh, a financial system that isn't there to really support and look after you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of places in the world, there's, there's a lot of movements where people are trying to get, they're trying to get resolve at a, at a top down level. Nelson believed that it had to be a grassroots method, whatever you're trying to do. If you want to affect change on something, it has to happen at the you and me level. And if you do it in this way, when it comes to the concept of infinite banking, you can slowly and individually make a voluntary choice to peacefully secede from a chunk of the financial system that's not that that you don't want to be a part of and you right. can be profitable in doing so and then if you slowly begin to share that message with other people more and more people do it you don't need to go and get changes you know at a at a federal or whatever level mm -hmm. because you can affect that change you know without even having asked permission and he was yeah. a real big advocate of that sort of thinking yeah. And, you know, it's, um, he he's, of course, he was so right. Um, what he was really talking about is, again, freedom, sovereignty, really. Yep. Sovereignty, which is the dominion to make decisions that impact your own, your own, your own life. There's a great book that was written, uh, sorry to talk about books, guys, but there was a great, great book written uh, that I'm sure Mr. Nash would have known about 
It was written in 1935 by an American economist uh, named Albert Knock, and it's it's called yes. "Our Enemy, the State." And Indeed, it's it's on his. I bet you Jason's got it on his. I've shelf got right it. There. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got so, it. Yeah, it says many great things, but yeah. one of the things that that it that uh, that Mr. Knock uh, hit on in the book was exactly what you said there, and that is that um, the closer we, we're going to be able to solve problems at the individual, at the community level, at the municipal level, even at the state level and federal level, uh, the closer uh, we get to the grassroots communities. So in other words, you know, if somebody's house is on fire, if all the neighbors get together, uh, they could probably put that fire out long be even before the fire department gets there. And when you magnify this out, what we have in Canada right now is we have a federal government that is completely alienated from Western Canada, uh, especially places like Alberta and Saskatchewan that, are, that have actually passed laws declaring sovereignty, which should be redundant because, you know, the Canadian Federation, Confederation, is actually envisioned and is legally uh, stipulated as a, as a marriage of sovereign states uh, that each have their own distinctive powers within certain areas. But what Albert Knox said that, that, that really, I think, would have resonated with Mr. Nash and probably did, is this idea that, you know, we can get together, we can do a better job, uh, you know, in our families, in our communities, uh, solving problems than government can ever do. And we can do it a lot more uh, uh, effectively and a, and a lot more a lot more cheaply without yeah. sacrificing our freedom, and this is what what Albert Knock talked about: is you know every time we go to a bank or or a government, uh, we have to give something up, and that's our freedom. And you know, uh, Ronald Reagan famously said, you know, the the scariest words in the English language are "I'm from the government and I'm here to help." And uh, you know, I think I, if you replace you know government with bank. I think that's that's sort of what uh, what Mr. Nash was talking about. He uh, and Rich, you would you would remember this, but he would often say, "Show me just one government program that's worked." Yeah, just one. Yeah, and I got to share now. I got to share this story. So my phone rings one day, and it's Nelson, and he. He said, uh, I just wanted to let you know that the rumors surrounding my early demise have been grossly over-exaggerated. <laughs> and, and I said, I beg your pardon? He said, have you, have you ever heard of the immovable object theory? I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, I was in my bathroom shaving and uh, I tripped and fell and hit my shoulder on the bathtub. And he said, would you believe it? That bathtub didn't move a single inch. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just, that was Nelson. And he, yeah. we were talking, we were talking before the show. Um, and this is relevant speaking to an attorney. So Nelson was in a meeting with a very prominent attorney in his hometown. And he's having this conversation about the process of becoming your own banker, the infinite banking concept. And he felt like he was uh, beginning to be drawn into trying to convince this, this attorney. And right. so he said, I politely ended the meeting early, indicating that I had somewhere else that I had to be. So I was packing up my things. I'm, I'm leaving the meeting. And I thought to myself, I am never going to try to convince anyone ever. This message is more caught than it is taught. And it cannot be taught through argument or uh, trying to convince someone. Mm -hmm. And then a short, a short while later, the attorney calls Nelson and said, Nelson, I, I forgot to ask you in our meeting whether or not you lend uh, money privately because I had heard that you did. Is that in fact true? And Nelson said, yes, it is. So this attorney wanted to purchase an airplane. Now, an airplane is not something that you just go to Walmart and pick up on your way. No, home. Like, no. It is an expensive piece of equipment. Yeah. 
So Nelson was very humble, but certainly had the resources to to uh, to do that. And he understood Why? airplanes very well, also. And yeah, he he was he, he was an aviator, right. And so he financed the airplane for the attorney and took the proceeds, the stream of payments, and purchased the very thing that he wanted the attorney to buy from him. And so he, he and he said, he would ask the question, who do you think got the better deal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he, he worked out a great financing arrangement with the attorney, but the attorney expanded Nelson's ability to lend capital. Yeah. And isn't that what the consumer does? Every time the consumer is sending money to someone else's bank, you're expanding right. that bank's capabilities to create right. more money where no money existed before. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. goodness. It, I'll share one more quick story, Rich. I got to share this because you're going to love this. So you remember in the book, Nelson talks about, he said, if, if I was, and he told it a little bit differently in person, he would say, Leighton, if you and I were to go to the busiest shopping center in your town and I wanted you to take me to the food court and I walked into that food court and I approached someone sitting down enjoying their lunch and I pulled out a revolver and pointed that gun right at that person's head and said, I need you to empty the contents of your wallet onto this table or I'm going to blow your brains out. Leighton, you and I can agree that that would be Robbery. Robbery. Absolutely. That would, be, that would be a criminal offense. Yeah. Very and serious. So he said, but if I was to have a conversation with everyone in the food court an hour before that person showed up and talked about how I'm going to distribute the contents of his wallet to everyone in the food court, that would be democracy in action. Right. <laughs> and so he just, oh boy, he just had such a great way of, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. You know uh, that story you told about the lawyer uh, reminds me of something that um, I mean it, it shows the difference between listening, right? And uh, you know, like really listening, active listening. And unfortunately, this is something that uh, that I don't think this is unique to lawyers, but it's probably true of bankers, <laughs> doctors. You know, people who let's say acquire a higher level of education, right? And, uh, you know, we become, we become know-it-alls, you know, we think that, you know, we, we sort it sort of gives education sometimes gives, uh, those of us who would have acquired it a sense of superiority mm -hmm. and, uh, it's sinful. It's a form of, of pride. And, uh, I fell into this as a young lawyer, I can tell you, um, as a young lawyer, people coming to see me, um, uh, you know, they would sit down with me and, and, uh, start talking within, Within the first five minutes, you know, I would be uh, interrupting and say, yeah, yeah, I got this. I know what your problem is. We got to do A, B, C, and D. I'm going to do this and that. Okay. And that's it. And, and I was famous uh, in, in the place where I worked for having the shortest client meetings. I couldn't believe how quick they could get clients in and out. And what happened was I was able to achieve, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, good results for the clients because, uh, you know, I was dedicated and I... I did have a good grasp of the law and I worked very hard, but I would get this kind of feedback from my clients. Uh, you know, I, I would get them the result that they wanted, but they would call up and they would complain about the bill. And I'd say, what, what's the problem with the bill? Is it too high? No, it, you know, it's just, you didn't listen to me. I don't feel like you heard me. Like, I don't understand what happened. You didn't explain to me the process and all this. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, what, like, what did you want? I, and here I had a complete misunderstanding of the expectation of my client, the consumer, the person who was hiring me, who was paying, you know, putting bread on my table. I was not giving them what they wanted. Right. What they wanted was an experience of a service relationship. They wanted someone to listen to them. That was key. Uh, they wanted things explained to them. And they wanted to know what was happening at, at every stage of the process. And I found that. Um, that really, I had to learn how to be a good listener. I had to learn to be patient. Uh, and, um, and I had to really work at active listening. And I think that's a problem that a lot of people have, especially uh, in the service. I know it's a problem that a lot of lawyers have. This is one of the main complaints that people have about lawyers. 
uh, that 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 lawyers do not communicate well, and that's really uh, that's really terrible because you know a lawyer should be somebody uh, who who has a command of the language and can communicate things effectively to a client. But you know, using your example when we started out when you were talking about the you know the the language of what is a contract, well you know if if Mr. Nash sat down with somebody and explained to them what a contract was. He could probably do a better job of that than most lawyers would, because most lawyers would fall into, you know, the lexicon of of uh, of legal language that people call legalese right. that they don't understand, you know, and uh, and that's really not communicating with people, and it's not giving people what they need. It's not imparting wisdom. It's not imparting confidence, right? And uh, and so yeah, when you said that about the lawyer, it just reminded me, you know, he probably wasn't listening to anything that that uh, Mr. Nash was was saying, because he had these preconceived ideas, oh, becoming your own banker, we you know what, what, you know, that's, that's right. bollocks, you know, how, how can that happen? You know, uh, not understanding that really, he was in the presence of somebody who was a bona fide financial genius. Yeah, well, and yeah. that's interesting, because Nelson talked about the arrival syndrome in the book. And when he was doing his live, his live seminars, that's the story he would tell, he would tell the lawyer story. <laughs> and, and that's kind of why he he emphasized the arrival syndrome. And it wasn't to, you know, pigeonhole that that environment, but it was just a real life experience that people could relate to. Yeah. And he was a master at meeting people where they're at. And that's, yeah. I think, really what you're identifying, Leighton. And, and it's so key. What I think is interesting is, you know, you've, you know, you mentioned that you've been in practice for 28 years. You know, you're, you're you're, you're seasoned in your practice, you're seasoned in what you do, you've developed a vast array of knowledge. You know, we can see the size of the books that are behind you on the screen for anyone watching on YouTube. And I know from our conversations, you are an avid reader, I would say you're, you know, when I think about people that I read, I think about Jason, I think about you, and I think about Nelson Nash, you, know, you guys are very avid readers. And so I'm curious when you think about you know, with a period that you find yourself in your life as you're, you're actually expanding your practice, you're, you're, you're opening up another office mm -hmm. in, Edmonton, in Edmonton, you've got an office in Calgary, you've got an office in Cold Lake. So congratulations on that and your success. What is, you know, what would you say when you think about the period that you are in your life, where you're at as, as a seasoned veteran and as an entrepreneur and only learning about Nelson and his message, you know, in, in this last period of time, you know, in the last kind of mm -hmm. six, eight months of your life, what comes up for you when you think about that relative to all the things you've yeah. done in the past and, and only kind of finding it now? Well, I know this is a bit of a cliche in his book, right? Everybody who comes across uh, his book says, oh, where have you been all my life? I wish I would have had this. So, you know, it wouldn't, at, at whatever age you're at, I think you would have a sense, oh, gee, I wish I would have known this sooner. I could have put this into, into effect sooner. I don't see it that way, you know, because I see, uh, I see knowledge and wisdom as as a journey, and uh, you know I'm a truth I'm a truth seeker, and this is why I have a I have a schedule where where I can I, I literally consume books I I, I consume book about two to three a week, um, whether they're audio books or or actual books, and of course I I read uh, I read the Bible uh, daily, mostly most of the New Testaments. I just uh, we just went through Easter, and uh, of course, every year I reread the Gospels, um, and just to renew my faith and and uh, you know come come to the cross. Uh, but uh, but really, I think for anybody at any age to discover this incredible piece of wisdom that's unleashed in this book is such it's so powerful. I just uh, you know I, I it's easy to say oh I wish I would have known about this five years ago where would I be. But I approach it from a point of view of gratitude and that I've discovered this illuminating concept at this moment in my life and that, that it can have a great impact on my future and the future of my friends and my family, my, my business partners. So, I mean, I guess I have a different outlook on it. And again, it's informed by my faith and the way I look at my life. Um, and uh, I would say the other thing about, about me that you know, Richard, is that um, I'm always trying to remake myself. It's and I don't say remake myself in terms of you know transitioning into anything, but I'm always trying to grow and learn and, and change because I can't stand still. I, I there's a there is a restlessness uh, uh, that that's in my personality, and uh, it's not because I'm dissatisfied with anything. 
I just don't, I, I just see myself as a work in progress. I, I have not achieved all the things that God has laid out for me. And so that's why I'm pursuing additional concept by opening new offices, expanding the scope of my practice and taking on new challenges there. And of course, taking on the, the whole concept of the podcast, which is, uh, you know, has been one of the greatest learning experiences of my life An absolute, what a gift it is to be to be introduced to people like like you guys, people like Dr. Jay Bhattacharya and Dr. Robert Malone, uh, I mean Eric Metaxas, the list goes on and on and on. And of course, uh, every one of those guests is another learning opportunity. It's like getting another bachelor's degree. You know, when I, when I had Eric Metaxas on the show, uh, I read four of his books before we did the interview. He was amazed. He couldn't believe it. Uh, he's you know. That I actually read all these books, and I said to him off camera, I said, "Well, you know, why would I? Why would I miss the opportunity of meeting you and not being able to talk to you about your amazing books?" This guy wrote uh, incredible biographies of people like Martin Luther and uh, and Lord Wilberforce. For those of you who know who that is, uh, and uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, um, mm. yeah. You know, and so that has been an, an amazing experience, and. Um, it saddens me actually that uh, we're living in a time in our culture when books are not valued the way they ought to be, certainly not the way Mr. Nash understood that, uh, you know, but just to have a book in your hand, a feeling of the texture of the paper. And I mean, that's why I'm, I'm surrounded by them. I have a Bible behind me that was uh, my oldest. I have a, actually have a collection of Bibles. Uh, people are going to wonder, what, why is he collecting Bibles? Uh, it's the greatest book ever. It's actually the greatest anthology of books. There's 66 of them. They're all great. Anyway, um, the, the Bible behind me was published in 1863. It's the oldest Bible I, I have. And uh, it's right here in my office and my studio. And uh, I keep it there as a comfort uh, to get me through these interviews because uh, normally I get grilled a lot harder than you guys are today. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, you, you know, we, we've, we been tend, throwing, we've been throwing softballs. We need to kick it up a notch later. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. We, we tend to go easy. Okay, uh, I appreciate it. But it's for other, you know, uh, for folks who are viewing this on uh, our YouTube channel and folks who are listening to this on uh, your favorite podcast platform. What would you? What would you sh say? What would you share with you know fellow um, practitioners? in in the legal business mm -hmm. about your discovery of this of this process well i think that um there are many many lawyers who um never discover the importance of business right. uh most lawyers uh, are competent in legal practice and can provide uh, a level of service to the client in fact the you know the law society does pretty good job of making sure that the lawyers who practice in any given jurisdiction in Canada, uh, you know, have a pretty good idea of what the law is and, and they can, and they can provide uh, proper service to clients, but that's only one part of it. And unfortunately, many lawyers never graduate out of that mindset. They see themselves only as lawyers. And, and, and if you're going to be in private practice, you're in a business and you better understand that you, that that business uh, you know, if you don't take care of business, um, that business is going to, you know, is not going to take care of you. And so um, I, I learned early on in my practice, again, from having uh, a couple of, of mentors who were not only good lawyers, but also conscientious business people, I learned the importance of, 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 you know, running a business. And so I'm always searching for ways to not only improve um, the profitability of the law business, but also thinking of ways to take the, the income that is generated by that law business and expanding it out into different concepts. So even before I was blessed to learn about uh, Mr. Nash, you know, I gotten into things, uh, obviously, things that most people get into, like, you know, the stock market, real estate, uh, you know, uh, precious metals and things of that nature. Um, but, and this really answers your question, uh, just about every lawyer who is in practice, even even the ones who are in very very large firms, um, are beholden to banks, right? And um, and really, this is uh, this is something that uh, 
you know, um, even though, and with, with uh, the greatest respect to the bankers who have uh, supported my business over the years, um, I would rather have them out of my life. Uh, you know, I'd rather not pay the interest. I'd, I'd rather not have to go hat in hand and beg to them, you know, for money to expand my business or, or you know, buy something that's necessary or acquire uh, another asset or things of that nature. I'd much rather be my own banker and be able to unleash the power of, of, of this concept that Mr. Nash came up with. And yeah. so this is why I'm very, uh, I, I, I learned about it actually by, uh, I learned about Richard uh, firstly by, uh, I, found a, I found out about him online, watched some of his podcasts. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to get this book. And uh, I read the book. And then from there, I said, you know, I really got to get this guy on my podcast and pick his brain and find out more about it. And of course, now I'm at this point, I'm, I'm fully, fully engaged and ready to, you know, di dive into the, into the pool and become, uh, you know, establish my own infinite banking system. Um, I have two sons, one who's 19 and one who's 15. And one of the things that I'm trying to impart, impart to them is a better understanding of, uh, you know, of, of financial education, which of course, as you know, is, is pretty decrepit in our schools. Uh, in Al and in Alberta, I just put in a, sh a shameless plug here. Um, this is what uh, Rachel Notley, who's the leader of the NDP in Alberta, this is what she thinks proper education should look like for young people. And this, I think Mr. Nash would find this horrifying. She says students should have a proper modern curriculum, one that actually prepares them for their future. And Mr. Nash might agree with that, but this is what she thinks that includes. Uh, she thinks that includes uh, information about climate change, gender equality, poverty reduction, LGBTQ2S plus rights, anti-racism and the history of residential schools. So what she thinks proper education for young people is us against the planet, men versus women, rich versus poor, gay versus straight, black versus white, and the indigenous people against the rest of Canada. Well, that's not a very good recipe for uh, a meaningful life or happiness, is it? And so part of the reason why I'm interested in this concept and I want to learn about it is I, not only do I want to achieve, I want to leave this generational wealth to my kids, I also want to impart to them this wisdom so that they will have the kind of education that, that Mr. Nash can impart. Uh, because if they have that kind of education, they won't need any of the stuff that uh, Rachel Notley is talking about. Very well said. Richard, take us home. Well, Leighton, uh, as as I expected, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Um, we appreciate uh, everything that you share with us, especially your your learning journey with the process of becoming your own banker and your your experience of uh, becoming an entrepreneur and successfully twenty eight years later still trudging along, looking at building and growing that uh, that legacy even further. One of the things that we like to to tune in with people who join us on the program is you know, something a little bit different. And we, you may not, you know, certainly today showing up in your, in your office with amazing books behind you. And uh, maybe you were in court earlier today, you've got the tie on. I don't imagine you show up to court very often with a cape. Um, but when you take on these massive litigations and you're helping, you know, 300 plaintiffs uh, successfully, you know, come to some resolve and you're doing these types of things and you're, and you're going about, sharing messages and interviewing amazing and powerful people who are sharing their messages on your podcast, on your show, you're actually showing up as a hero. That's what I believe. And I, mm. I think that it's so important, the work that you're doing. And so um, our question for you really is, who do you most want to be a hero to? I would say to my, uh, to my children, uh, to my sons. Um, and uh, I don't see myself as a hero. That's very kind of you to, to say that about me. I would say, though, I would use a different word. I would say that I'm a person who uh, has charisma. Uh, now, charisma is a misused word. People think that's something that, uh, you know, maybe someone like Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt has or, you know, some movie star. But charisma is actually a word that means Christ within. It means that you are walking in, in the footsteps of, of our Savior, of our Lord and Savior. And that is we're walking out our purpose, uh, the purpose that was laid out for us, that uh, we're living a life of humility, that we're living a life of gratitude, that we're living a life of purpose, and that our goal is to, is to help other people. 
And um, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm just trying to use what the Lord has given me, what the, the gifts that I have uh, to, to leave that, that legacy uh, to, to the people that I'm helping and to my family. And with the podcast, really, I've been thinking about this recently. Um, uh, and I'll just share this with you just to finish off. You know, there was a time last year when I was thinking about giving up the podcast. You know, it was taking up a lot of time. It was just me and a laptop. And then an incredible thing happened. Some people at something called the Miracle Channel contacted me. And they said, you know, we've, we've seen your podcast. And, you know, we really think that you, that you have something. <laughs> and I was like, really? What is it? Because I don't know. But, but they said, you know, we think you have something. We think we could take it to another level. Like we have, we have the television expertise. We have access to millions of viewers. Uh, we can, in, you know, we can improve the production values and get better guests and all that stuff. And I was like, wow. Here I was thinking that I was going to give all this up. And then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, out of the clear blue sky, comes somebody, comes the Miracle Channel and said, you know what? Not only are we, you're not going to give this up late, you're going to take this to another level. You know, it's going to be like, remember, Emerald, we're going to kick this up a notch. That's right. And, uh, and so that's really, that, that, that to me, uh, it, those, those little things that happen, they're not coincidence. Those are signs that, that we're on the right track, that we're doing the right thing, that we're, we're living a life of vocation and purpose and meaning. And so that's really, that's really what I'm doing. That's really what I'm acting out. So that's a long-winded way of saying is I'm trying to be an example to, to my kids and, and other people that, you know, this is one way to live a meaningful life. Uh, Albert Einstein said many brilliant things, but he said uh, something that I think Mr. Nash, I think he actually quoted in, in his book. He said that, you know, there's, there's only three ways to influence other people. The first is example. The second is example. And the third is example. <laughs> and so really, um, that's, that's what I'm trying to live out. Um, and if, if that is inspiring other people, then, you know, that pleases me and I'm humbled by that. So I, I thank you for saying that, but I don't see myself as a, as a, as a hero. I only have one hero and that's, that's the, that's the one who, uh, we just, we just celebrated his, uh, you know, his, uh, he's risen. Uh, you know, we just had, uh, you know, Easter. That's my hero. That's the only hero I have. But I, but I thank you for saying that's very kind, generous of you to say that. But I don't see myself in that way. But I do, I do put upon myself um, the role, the, 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 I won't say the burden. I, I, I would say I put on the mantle of leadership. And I'm trying to live that out in my best way. And if that inspires people, then, then, that, uh, then that's wonderful. Thank you. That's amazing. And what a great conversation about, uh, you know, how to become your own banker legally. <laughs> there's uh, We don't want to do it illegally. <laughs> there's, there's actually, uh, Leighton, there's a great book uh, that I would recommend that you read if you haven't already. It's titled Anointed for Business. Wow, uh, I have not. Would you email me that? that I'd yeah, love to read that book. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. It was gifted to me from a client of mine who's a pastor. and. Um, he said, I really need you to read this because I really truly believe this is what you were anointed to do. And uh, it, oh, it's a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. um, I will say to everybody who's uh, watching us on YouTube, so you will see a playlist. It just showed up. That's our technical team. Wonderful people whom we appreciate very much because neither Richard or I would even remotely know how to do that. <laughs> and so thank you for... Uh, tuning in for watching uh, the playlist is there to encourage you to continue your journey of learning. So just click through to the next video that's been recommended for you. Continue your journey of learning. There's always something new to learn. There's no such thing as having arrived in knowledge. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Make the rest of your week outstanding. Leighton, this was a sincere pleasure. We will have you back again. Uh, that we can assure you. And uh, it was just a real pleasure having this conversation. So gentlemen, thank you.